had the pleasure of announcing the final speaker. We go back to the future, the urban future, and this gentleman is called Philipp Rude of LSE, London School of Economics, uh, and their Cities Group. Welcome to EcoSummit. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, let me start by, can we have the slides, please? By saying how much I'm impressed by what I've seen just over the last uh, hour. It makes me feel I'm in the wrong business as someone who is working at a university and sort of mainly engaging with research and policy making. It, it's really inspiring and um, I'll take you in a slightly different direction uh, to close this off. I'm speaker number 33, so I do uh, uh, understand that, you know, I, I want to keep this rather uh, quick for you to have then the deserved uh, dinner party. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, mainly a research program uh, which we conducted with cities around the world uh, in relation to building what's called the green economy. And we call that the next economy because we believe the green economy, what you are doing, is the next economy. And we also believe that cities matter enormously. So as an introduction here, um, let's just remind ourselves why is it that cities come up always if we're talking about uh, futures, if we talk about green, if we talk about uh, problems and solutions. Well, number one, the world is rapidly urbanizing. We have hit the 50% uh, urban and whether, you know, these images is Sao Paulo, whether it looks like, like that or uh, this is Mexico City, more sort of sprawling, low density uh, development. It has enormous implications for all the things you are doing and enormous implications for uh, a common future. Uh, in Europe, I think developments are more subtle. We are rediscovering our cities. That's important too. We are rediscovering urban living, more efficient living, uh, a very important component of, um, I think, resource efficiency, which we're all exploring. But there are other reasons why cities matter uh, quite dramatically. And one is uh, the vulnerability cities possess. They are basically optimized si systems where you have, with a little bit of interruption, uh, quite dramatic effects, and to some extent they are responsible for what we're seeing here. Um, by far the largest proportion, if you look at different settlement uh, types, the largest proportion of CO2, just one example, comes from urban areas. So cities are s solutions and they are uh, problems at the same time. And finally, and this is maybe a sort of the key driver of what, why we are engaging with cities, it's a failure of nation states, it's the failure of international negotiation. This is a photo that was taken at the Copenhagen Climate Summit in 2009. Pure desperation in the main plenary, while next door mayors were gathering and actually started committing to very tangible goals, very tangible ideas, uh, which have been implemented since. So we wanted to test this hypothesis. Is it really true that cities are leading the next economy and that we are seeing a lot of new innovation being developed politically through urban governments? Uh, so we looked for two partners. One is ICLE, uh, the sort of global uh, organization of city governments, and the other one is the Global Green Growth Institute, uh, which was at the time still in South Korea and then moved to Copenhagen. And we surveyed a total of uh, 90 cities globally, and in an another eight cities we did in-depth research, interviewing people, understanding what policymakers are doing. Now, before I go into the top four messages which we identified, let me give you a perspective on how cities assessed the green policy and their progress to date. I'm going to use similar slides um, a few times, so let me introduce uh, how the graphics work first and then I go into the content. So what we basically have here in the shades from uh, yellow to gray is the responses of these individual cities. Anything that's sort of uh, yellowish is a positive response to these questions and then we ranked the responses according uh, to the sort of uh, main, main positive feedback. So here the question is about which policy sectors uh, have been really uh, made uh, enormous progress. And what you can see here is green space, recycling, composting, water pollution. The easy bits, the low-hanging fruit, you might argue, are the ones where we have seen significant progress. The biggies, greenhouse gas emissions, energy security and resource consumption, are the ones cities continue to struggle with. Let's look into the key uh, messages. Number one, what are the policy sectors where cities are making a difference? Um, and the first thing to say here is that cities are breaking down traditional policy sectors, and that is good news. The most innovative stuff is happening where you combine these sectors, where you cut across 
where you don't isolate or sort of keep just within uh, one system. Cities are far better equipped to understand system dynamics between these different sectors than national policymakers because they're exposed to these things on a daily basis. Now still, and you'll know this, most government structures are set up tackling traditional sectors. Therefore, we did inquire about, okay, so how do these different sectors work? Which ones are you particularly active? Which ones less so? And I think of this list here, the only exception is food. It's an interesting one. It has a lot to do with where cities have actual political power and where they can do something about, and food is not really a classic urban policy area. But I predict uh, that this is going to change. Food is one of those issues which is hitting hard on the agenda of urban, while the others have traditionally long been uh, a focus. We then ask the question, and this is the link to the economic side of it. So leaving green policy uh, for the sake of saving the planet aside for a moment, but asking about where does it help to deliver economic growth, economic development? What are the top sectors where you can achieve and create this wonderful synergy? And this is where you're hitting the big ones. Transport, energy, and buildings, obviously. But in the individual cities, there are massive differences. And let me just pick the top two. Transport, a classic urban sector. A lot of innovation has happened here and is globally driven by city governments. No doubt about that. If you zoom into the energy sector, that's quite different. What we're seeing here is the world's largest offshore wind park, which is called London Array, not too far from here in the North Sea. But it has actually nothing to do with London. This is a pure branding approach. London's government has close to zero political power to determine energy policy. That can be dramatically different in the case of Munich, for example, where the city owns 100% the local utility company, Germany's, I think, sixth largest utility company. And through that ownership, they can set political, strategic targets long-term, independent from market pressures, such as the one 100% renewable by 2025 a very innovative company with a lot of tangible outcomes to date already. Moving on, second message. Uh, cities are first mover. Now that's sort of the cliche, uh, and we looked a bit behind uh, that assumption. Um, and first, uh, let's just look at the so-called pioneering cities, uh, a few selected ones. And uh, we actually uh, were able to get some of the key data that's then usually used to back those assumptions. And yes, there is indeed very robust evidence that cities are leading something which environmentalists call decoupling, the decoupling of negative growth tendencies like CO2, energy consumption, and so on, and economic growth, health, uh, welfare, and so on. Take Copenhagen. Look how dramatically CO2 has been reduced within the city, and at the same time how GVA has been going up, and cycling going up, and population even being growing. So there is something to be said about cities leading and pioneering. And when we ask about the attitudes of cities, uh, we get very interesting results in relation to doing, I think, what you are caring a lot about, which is new technology, green technology, and innovation. Uh, we found that almost 30% of our cities were not only innovative, but they stated they are open to experiments, i.e. they are open to failure, and that's crucial. These cities are able to hold your hands in an experiment and acknowledge that net not everything might go according to plan, but there's still um, a lesson where you can learn from those things. Still, about 50% of the cities are innovative, but constrained by budgets. And this is, of course, where the financing story kicks in. And only 13% called themselves extremely conservative, waiting until someone else would have done it, and then they just follow up. We then looked more specifically at the different technology areas and then within these areas also what kind of specific technologies are cities actually uh, banking on. Again, the sort of big categories, transport, energy, buildings come first. Let's have a closer look what's actually behind. So in transport, by far the most important, intelligent traffic management, followed by integrated transport systems and then the famous uh, apps, the mobile phone apps, which we all probably appreciate by now. In energy, distributed energy generation, top. Second, smart electricity grids and buildings, building control systems, followed by energy-efficient appliances. Let's move on to the third uh, lesson, which is really about uh, collaboration. A lot of collaboration in cities happens actually with the general public. That's a key point I want to make here, but there are also sort of collaborative practices 
uh, which go far beyond. I mean, if you think about it, what are cities about? It's about gossip, meeting, being able to connect physically. And that's what cities do, often also administered through city governments extremely well. We asked about the triggers of green policy, the triggers for you know, enabling a lot of the technologies you are uh, engaged with. Public opinion was number one. That's a big surprise. You would never get this if you do a national survey around this. But the second point matters equally. It's political leadership. And the two combined create this unique energy, which is typically urban. We also ask about the involvement of different stakeholders during the process of setting up green policies. And again, the general public community groups come first. It's a surprise, but at the same time, yes, who do you do these technologies for and who do you need also for your innovation process? You need to engage with citizens and work with them. And a lot of cities have done that rather well. But your partnerships need to go far beyond that. And the most successful cases of innovation still rely on a partnership between cities and then also national or regional government. And the German uh, Electric Mobi Mobility Initiative is one example where Berlin is only able to do what it's currently doing because there's big national commitment. And unfortunately, London in the same space is failing for precisely that reason, because national government doesn't believe in green, unfortunately, at this very moment. Last point, and this is cities as placemakers, a unique ability and capacity which cuts, uh, or which, which really uh, isolates cities from other governments, which rarely really talk about placemaking, the construction of you know, architectures and physical space. The key policy tools cities use, development planning, standards and regulation, public awareness, they already point towards the idea of creating places places of interaction, places for technology, and so on. We also ask about the key capabilities cities have and urban planning features first. It is one of the most important policy tools cities have for the very long term to determine how much we are able to adjust to a sustainable future. And that adjustment happens at the metropolitan level. Urban form at that scale already determines how much you can green these places in the next 100 years. It's so important, you cannot overemphasize it. The distribution of functions, the density of where people live. You know, we want to do car sharing, you need a threshold density. You want to do energy efficient buildings, threshold density, and so on. There are enormous varieties, and obviously, these places suffer or profit from these structural capacities to green. But there's also workplace density, very important. Not only look at where people live, look at where people work, and this is where London looks much better. It's also the local question about the neighborhood scale, the kind of streets and layouts cities have that determine a lot of activities that lie behind. Uh, and, you know, I stress, this is where we're locking in, not only for a few years, but for the next 30, 40, and 50 years. So we need the thinking about the new technological opportunities precisely in this context. And finally, it's not only about new spaces and building the new. A lot has to do, particularly in Europe, with the retrofitting agenda. Equipping existing urban form with the right kind of buildings, with the right kind of infrastructures, so that it can then facilitate the green economy I've been talking about. So I hope that was sort of a, a nice end to a long, long day, and I wish you uh, wonderful drinks. Fascinating, Philip, thank you so much.